Okay, confession time. When I came to do the book of James, to begin the book of James, many months ago, we, we've been verse by verse through the entirety of the time that we've been going through the book of James, I have been dreading this Sunday. When I thought, okay, there's a book of James, what is there to deal with? Oh, I'm looking forward to digging into this passage a bit more, and I'm looking forward to understanding that a little bit better. And then I thought of this passage, and I would always shudder, because this is one of the most problematic passages in the whole of the New Testament, as I understand it. And it's one, it's one of those ones I think some people don't think is a problem, and, and it's kind of brushed aside when there are actually some real issues here. So let's have a little look. Um, before we get into the specifics verse by verse, let's just look over the passage as a whole. If anyone uh, among you is suffering, let him pray. Is anyone cheerful, let him sing praise. If anyone among you is sick. Now this is where it gets a little bit weird. It's, this is where the passage is something that is unusual to us and has a few problems. It says, if someone is sick, let him call for the elders of the church, let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Therefore, uh, sorry, raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another, that you may be healed." There's a lot of problems there, even at first glance. Number one is this. How many churches regularly have anointings? Like, you know, I, I, don't, I know that in, in the back we've got all the stuff ready for communion whenever we use it, but I'm not aware of there being a sort of bottle of olive oil ready for any anointing that's requested. It's not something that we typically do. Is that right? Is that wrong? Should there be? Is this the, the way of dealing with sick people? Then there is another issue here, which is that the implication of the passage is that when the elders of the church come and they pray for a person and they do anoint them with oil, that that person will be saved. And in that context, it seems to almost certainly be speaking about saving in the sense of physically, then being healed. And therefore, there is this sort of almost presumption of healing that is given in the passage. That's something that most commonly in our circles is just brushed aside. But it does seem to say that. And then there's that little bit at the end where it connects the confessing of sins with the healing that then comes. And then we get into the really dangerous Job's friend territory where people will point to this verse and they will say, see, if you're, if you're sick, it's because of your sin in your life. And then you get all the kind of health, wealth and prosperity churches that try and say, ah, oh, the only reason that you're, you're sick is because of your sin and you just need to have enough faith and you'll be healed. And they love this passage because they can wrench it from its context and they can do that kind of thing. So this is a difficult passage. And um, I don't claim to be the last word on this, but I will do my best to interpret it for you and show you what it means. But in addition to that, there is a whole bunch of really good stuff in this passage that should not be overlooked or neglected. So let's dig in and see what we're doing here. We've just had in verse 12... The kind of summary statement, above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or uh, any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, that you may not fall under judgment. God is the judge and he judges those. And the whole point of this book from beginning to end has been about the fact that we as Christians should not be double-minded, that we need to decide we're going to follow Jesus and follow him, that we must not be people who are, who are on the one hand saying, I want to serve God, I want to live for him, and on the other hand are saying, yeah, but I, I don't want to give this up, and I, and I want to be comfortable, I don't want to have a hard life, and I really can't be expected to do that, and really we're not supposed to believe this in this day and age. And, and there's, there's this double mind where we're kind of like we're undecided we kind of want Jesus but we want to tag him on and that's something that is that is a common concept right through the Old Testament remember James is preaching to Jewish Christians and they are well aware of the Old Testament heritage where again and again and again the Jews would say yep Yahweh's our God we're going to worship Yahweh but we're also going to have a little bit of Baal and we might slip in a little bit of Molech and whatever else and so there is this sense in which 
which the the double mindedness is something that has that has just infiltrated and, and destroyed Israel throughout its history and that this is exactly what James is dealing with so in verse 12 as he comes to the end he's saying you need you know he's taking the well-known expression of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount which goes back to Leviticus 19 as we dealt with last time but in summary he's really saying when you say you're going to follow Jesus you follow him you stick with your decision you don't be this half-hearted Christian that is adultery friendship with the world so that's really the whole kind of context and as we come then to to having kind of wrapped things up it's kind of almost the crescendo of the book the, the how this last bit fits in is really intriguing it begins with a question is any among you suffering and of course all of this links back to the beginning of the book the ending is like the beginning and the beginning reminds you of the ending it's what scholars call an inclusio it's what I call a sandwich it just basically means you got the same thing at the beginning and at the end kind of linking the book together so flick back with me if you would to the beginning of chapter one where the whole book kicked off as you recall those of you who were here though so many months ago it says in chapter one and verse two count it all joy my brothers ladies you're included that's a uh, an inclusive plural there brothers and sisters when you meet trials of various kinds for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect and you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing we hate trials we hate suffering man I really hate suffering it's like Lord I had enough of this you know how much more and so we have this natural tendency to shy away from trials to shy away from suffering but what we should understand and know is that the reason that God allows these trials and this testing and this suffering into our lives is because what it does here in the text is it tests our faith matures it and produces steadfastness this this patient endurance that we've spoken about in the book of James where all of this stuff is happening and we just are we are resolute to be faithful to Jesus I am not going to let how I am treated let what happens to me in life determine how I respond right is right and wrong is wrong when life goes well and right is right and wrong is wrong when life doesn't go well it doesn't change and so we have this steadfastness that is only really tested and is only really produced in trials if your life goes really really well and you never have any trials well you never find out the state of your faith you can say oh I love you Jesus I'll follow you wherever you lead me and then if all you ever do is take in a nice income live in a nice house have a nice job never get sick and have a wonderful life you'll never know if you would follow Jesus in any other circumstances you just simply don't so the faith is tested and this steadfastness is created and when steadfastness this patient endurance has its full effect then you will be perfect and complete lacking in nothing in other words this is the path to Christian maturity and then he asks a question essentially I mean it's not directly a question but there's the implication of such if any of you lacks wisdom let him ask God now this is going to be relevant because this let him ask God first of all just a little bit of English grammar when you see the expression let him ask well it, it doesn't mean let in the sense of oh would that be all right do you mind it's it's awkwardly it's a way that we communicate in English a command in in the third person essentially it's saying he must ask God it's a command and we're going to see this same structure the same command three times in chapter five when we nip back, back in a minute so let if any of you lacks wisdom let him ask God and as I told you when we started the book and multiple times since the book starts with a shocking beginning that basically can you consider trials to be joyful can you consider them to be a good thing do you see the purpose in them or is your comfort your passion your desires how you want your life to go your well-being you being in control are all of these things more important and it's just a stunning indictment on most of our lives so he says well if you do that you'll lack nothing but do you lack wisdom wisdom not being the sense of knowing what to do here but being in the sense of living the right way wisdom being the path of wisdom the way that you live 
Are you not living the right way? Are, are you somehow not mature? Have you not been through this process of considering trials to be joy? Then what you have to do is this, ask God and he'll give you wisdom. And he gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. Now this is important context because we're going to come to this in chapter 5. You pray and you will get the answer to that prayer. Do you understand that? It's, it's definitive. You lacking in wisdom? Are you not mature in your faith? Just ask God to make you mature. And he'll make you mature. Guaranteed. 100% of the time, that prayer is answered positively. Two caveats. Number one, what are you asking for? How does maturity happen? That's the previous verses. You're asking for trials. God, I want to be like Jesus. Oh, but not that way. Right? That's what we're praying for if we pray for maturity. We're praying for him to bring about that steadfastness that we might lack nothing. Are you lacking in wisdom? Is your walk imperfect in some way? Well, pray that he matures you. And so you lack nothing. How do we lack nothing again? Oh, that's through the steadfastness. How do we get that again? That's through trials. You're essentially asking to be tested. And the other caveat is here in the text. There's what goes before and there's what follows. Let him ask in faith with no doubting. For one who doubts is like a wave that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. What's it saying? It's saying this. If you ask for maturity, then you have to really want it. If you are there saying... I want to be more like Jesus. Cross your fingers behind your back. But, but, I, but I don't want to have to suffer. I don't want to have to go through this. I don't want trials. I don't want difficulties. I don't want all of this. Then you really don't want to be like Jesus. That is the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith is says, look, I know this is going to be a living hell. I know I may have to lose things I never want to let go of. I know that, that I could go through things that I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy, but if that's what it takes to make me like Jesus, God, give it to me. That's the kind of prayer that's guaranteed an answer in the positive. Absolutely guaranteed. So why is it that people say, I want to be more like Jesus, and they never change? Because they don't really want to be like him. They want to have a comfortable, cozy life. They want to have their passions met. They want to do the things that they want to do. They are the one who is important. Their, their wants, their desires, their needs, these things are more important. And so, really, they are this double-minded person who, on the one hand, is saying, give me Jesus, and on the other hand, is saying, give me the world, give me myself, give me my desires, give me my wants, give me everything I want. That's how the book started. And that's our context. We'll see parallels. Let's have back to chapter 5 and verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? <clears throat> Is anyone among you suffering? You see immediately the context and the link with chapter 1, right? The whole point of chapter 1, the whole point of the, the kickoff, the thing that's been taught the whole way through, is this is not going to be easy. You want to be like Jesus. You want to live God's way. You want to know that you're going to live completely and totally for him. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. If that's going to be the case, it's going to involve suffering. It's going to. And therefore, it is perfectly fitting and it follows on perfectly from the statement of verse 12, some of these people are going to be trying to live the right way. Some of these people are determined to be single-minded. And so the question is incredibly valid. Is any of you suffering? And if you are suffering, what do you do? There is a command. There's something you must do when you suffer. And that is pray. You must pray. Now, I, I want us to understand this. Because I'm very aware that in our kind of circles, where we rest heavily on the sovereignty of God where we talk about things like suffering being part of the journey to maturity and it's God-ordained suffering and all of this, and, and we see God's sovereignty and all of that, one of the things that we can very easily do if we are not careful is we can become very blasé about suffering. Not when we're going through it, of course, because that's the end of the world, but I mean when other people are going through it. We can be blasé. And we can very easily get ourselves in this kind of situation where we can basically be suffering and just say, you know, even with regards to ourselves, you know, 
well, you know, I guess this is just what God has ordained and I've got to consider it joy. And you must, and it is. And, and these things are all true. But it's so easy to forget how much God cares. It's so easy. And, I, and, I, and I'm going to be really frank here and the possibility of offending a few people, but this is epidemic in Calvinistic circles where we're so focused on the sovereignty of God and he's in charge and he, you know, this suffering and, and you get people in churches who come and say, oh, I'm broken, I'm just falling apart, this is so hard and this is so difficult. And then the, you know, the, the, the only counsel they get is, well, God's sovereign, just consider it joy. See you next week. And that is just despicable. I embrace 100% that God is sovereign in the midst of the worst of trials. I embrace 100% that he allows those trials to come in his sovereignty for our good and our maturity. But boy, does it hurt. And I pray in this church that God raises up an army of people who don't just simply say, well, God's in control but have the spiritual gift to come alongside and weep with you. That's so important. And what this verse here reminds us to do is that when we are suffering, then we need to pray. Just because God uses suffering in our lives doesn't mean we don't say, God, please take this from me. Because if that's a sin, then Jesus is a sinner. Garden of Gethsemane, anybody? It's perfectly fine for us to say, God is sovereign, he allowed this, this is for my good, but please, if it's possible, take it away. I don't know if I can bear it any longer. And when people are feeling that way and praying those prayers, I do not want us to ever be a church where people just fob off people like that and just dismiss them and say, oh, well, you know, God's sovereign, blah, 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 blah. We weep with those who weep. And you say, oh, yeah, but you know, man, they're just upset about something and it's just so insignificant to you. But the fact that it's killing them shows how much it means to them. And to say, well, I will weep with people when they weep over what I consider weepable, but I won't weep with people when I don't consider that to be something that's significantly, you know, bad enough for weeping. That is, that is not, there's nothing godly about that. It's one of the most self-interested, narcissistic approaches to the faith. How ridiculous. Maybe they're weeping because they're struggling with something that their own sin brought on. Have you never had struggles that have been brought on by your sin? Maybe they're weeping because something's happening that, that they can't deal with because they're so immature in their faith. What, you became a Christian and you became mature in five minutes? Oh, well, they've been a Christian for many years, you might say. What, so you became a Christian and you got matured at the perfect rate? And anybody who matured slower than you is somehow less good than you? Shame on us for thinking such things. So this is an astonishingly important counterbalance. That yes, God uses suffering. Yes, God is sovereign over suffering. But when we suffer, let us pray. And I think that that is something that is overlooked. Now, in contrast to that, there's the other side of things, which is, is anyone cheerful? Now, this is, this is not what it initially appears to be. Yes, in one sense, it does say cheerful, and it does kind of mean cheerful. And as such, it is a contrast, and a, a parallel, as it were, with suffering. On the one hand, there's people suffering. On the other hand, there's people cheerful. But this is not the usual word for cheerfulness. It is a word that's only used one other time in Scripture. Um, I won't have you turn there. I want to deal with it briefly. But Paul is sailing for Rome. Things aren't going very well. There is a storm at sea, and we have a shipwreck that is imminently approaching. I'm reading from Acts chapter 27 and verse 21. 
since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, men, you should have listened to me and have not set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Look, told you so in the Bible. Look at that, fancy that. Yet I now urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. Take heart. Same word as we have here. Take heart. <laughs> hey, Paul says, I've got really good news for you. Something to be cheerful about. Take heart in this. We're about to be shipwrecked. Everything's going down. We're going to lose everything. Isn't that great news? What's good about that? Well, none of us are going to die. You're like, well, I maybe wouldn't have picked that as being the good news, right? I mean, sure, that's better than dying when the ship is wrecked, but, but that's not what I would say is something to take heart over. And, and I think that when we see Paul, you, uh, we see James using the same word as Paul here in, in James, that we need to understand it as being that kind of thing. It isn't just in a sense, hey, did any of you happen to be really happy today? Oh, I'm so happy. You know, it's more in a sense, are any of you taking heart? So rather than it being a direct parallel, some are, some are, are suffering, some are happy, it's more of a progressive parallel where it goes from some people are there suffering and they need to be praying and then some people are taking heart in the midst of suffering. I'm not convinced that this is saying, look, some of you suffer and some of you don't suffer. Because quite frankly, life is ridiculously hard. And I don't think that we have seasons when we suffer and seasons when we don't suffer. I think we have seasons when suffering is greater and suffering is less. We live in sinful bodies, in a sinful world, surrounded by sinners like us, and this whole thing is a mess. And one day God is going to send back his son and Jesus is going to return and he's going to redeem this whole place, praise God. But for now, it's a stinking mess. And there are struggles and trials everywhere we go. You go to work, you're surrounded by sinners. You go to school, you're surrounded by sinners. People who hate you, people who want to hurt you, people who want to give you a hard time. So you lock yourself in a room all by yourself and you've still got someone who hates you and wants to give you a hard time. Because a sin in your heart is out to get you. And so there is this thing and that, that, that suffering is not avoided. And so are you taking heart? Let him sing praise. Now let us, let's take a step back. If we see that, those questions in that way, then the praying here, though I, though I totally embrace that there is a place for us to pray and say, God, just take this from me, please. At the same time, I think contextually, we need to also, in addition, see the, the prayer as being a prayer of acceptance. Because there are those who've taken heart in their suffering, and there are those who perhaps haven't taken heart. Where's the prayer in the parallel passage at the beginning of the book? If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. Let him pray. So when you're going through suffering, pray to God. God, give me wisdom, help me, mature me. Okay, how's it going with that? You taking heart? Are you rejoicing in Christ in the midst of trials? Then sing praise. That's our second command here. Let him, uh, let him praise. Let him sing praise. Friends, we, we underestimate singing. We underestimate it. Um, I really don't want to tread on toes, but there's things that need to be said. So let me just say them. Forgive me. I'm just doing my job, just teaching the text. Our service starts at 10.45, and we begin with a prayer, and then we sing. And singing is part of church. Now, it isn't to pick on anyone individual. Some of you can only get here later, and I'd rather you were late than not at all. And if you get out of bed and you're running late, I would much rather you came in halfway through the sermon that didn't come at all. I'm all for that. I'm, I would rather you came to church and you're exhausted and you fell asleep for half of the sermon and caught 10 minutes of it than stayed at home and didn't catch those 10 minutes. So I'm all for grace. And those of you who know me know that. But at the same point, 
Our worship is really important. It, we, don't, we don't just sing because, you know, well, we've got to fill up our service time. We have a bit of Bible reading. We have a bit of prayer and we do the sermon. And, and singing would be nice. Let's stick that in. It's a biblical mandate. It's a biblical mandate. It's there in Ephesians. It's there in Colossians. And we sing and we worship and we praise God with songs. And do you know why? Because what happens in singing is completely different than what happens in any other format. With music, words have a different impact. I can point you to kids who are five, six, seven, eight, nine, and they go to school and you say, what did you learn today at school? I can't remember. But the, the, their, their favorite rock star, their latest song, they know every single lyric. Not to mention the dance moves these days for their TikTok videos. They, can, they memorize all the words. They know exactly. And th there, is, there, is, there is something about the act of singing that we take words and by putting them to melody and, and, to, and bringing them through that vehicle that our emotions are engaged in addition to our mind in a way that combines to enhance memory, to enhance understanding, and to consider the impact upon it. Now, I understand we have a huge problem in America today with churches seeing worship purely on the emotional side and the whole thinking part has gone out the window. But I know that's not predominantly our problem here. We need to see it as being a problem almost the other way, in that you know, we, we've got to do both of these things. We have to think about what we're singing, and as we sing, we're not just engaging our mind, though we must engage our mind, we're engaging our hearts as well, and as we sing, we engage in an act of worship. And there is something even beyond worshiping in your car and in your home or what have you. There's something about when the saints come together, Boy, did we learn this the last year and a half. When the saints come together and they sing, and there are words up on the screen, and I am in my head saying, these things are true. Let me engage my heart and communicate these things to God, to those around me, to myself. And you next to me are doing the same thing. And this person over there is doing the same thing. And we together are saying, this is true. We believe it. And there's power in that. Absolute power in that. And I understand that there may be traditions that, you know, you have and some people are happy doing all of this and some people have to be like this. And, and you just, you be you. No one's judging you. You want to wave a bit, wave a bit. You want to stand like a statue, stand like a statue. No one's judging you either way. I hope they're not. Anyway, I'm not. But you need to worship. You need to worship. Let it out. Just let it out. And as you sing boldly then the people around you feel that boldness used to there used to be ch uh, services church type services that we had when i was at school and occasionally uh, my cousins went to the same school as me um, my school's weird english school think harry potter and all the houses that was my kind of school but without the magic just weirdness um, but that was my kind of school so i was there at school and i had to, and i lived there from a very young age and, and what have you and my cousins well one of my cousins at the school as well and then occasionally for some of the services when they were in the evening on a sunday parents would come in if they were local and my uncle would often come occasionally come to the services and boy, can my uncle sing. And so we were there, and you know, normally at the service, you'd be, uh, 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 and my uncle was there, and it was, bum, 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 you know. This, this is the guy who, who will sing, you know, sing uh, songs and uh, or hymns and otherwise at rugby games, and five rows around him would know that he was there, you know. And uh, he would sing. And, I, and even as a young lad, it would be a case of, wow, we're singing, are we? And my volume would pick up, and my cousin next to me, his volume would pick up. And our row would just be the row, you know? It would be like in this vicinity, like in this, this circle around my uncle, there was just a... There were, and it wasn't just volume. It was passion, you know? And, and you know what? We're put to shame. Right now, the world's most important sport, which of course is football, which you use the term erroneously, you, you, you call it soccer or something, I understand that, but it's, it is football. They're having the, the European Championships right now. And if you, if you go in and watch any of those games, you will hear singing. 
and there are people who sing. Why do they sing so loudly and so passionately? Because they love their team. And they want to encourage their team. And they want to encourage the people around them for their team. And I could embarrass myself with all of the Tottenham Hotspur songs, but I won't. But I know half of them. And I tell you what, when I kind of sing them at home, when I'm watching TV, it doesn't do much. But when I go down to the Greyhound on um, Figu Figueroa, I think it is, or Figueroa Street, which is the home of Tottenham Hotspur in Los Angeles, and the pub is full of everybody singing, and we're giving, ah, you feel it. Do we not love Jesus more than that? Is, is he not worth singing about? Because I tell you this, if you come to church and you've had a great week, everything's going well, you just got a raise, your wife told you you look wonderful, she gave you a kiss on the cheek, made you a cup of coffee, you're going in, there's no traffic, all the lights are green, and you come to church, you're, Whoa, you just feel great. And you worship, that's a good worship right there. But when everything's, everything's falling apart, when your life is this huge trial, when you don't know how you're going to cope tomorrow, when church is just this refuge in the midst of madness, and you come in, and all you want to do is sob, when you can take heart, when you can say, God, you are sovereign even in this, then when you say, Behold our God. It means something. It means so much more. And when you say, as we sung for the first time this morning, to him be your glory, to him be your majesty, power and authority, it takes you apart from your, your petty little lives and our petty little problems. I know they're huge, they're big, they affect us, but not compared to eternity and not compared to God and not compared to all his glory. And we will look at our sins and our failings and our sufferings and our trials in, 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 the, in the light of eternity and all we will do is worship him. Can we not just get a glimpse of that now? That's my rant on worship. Take heart and sing praise. Okay, here's a bit I've been avoiding. For however many weeks this has been hanging over me, let's deal with this. I've been looking forward to wrestling with this. I think I understand it. Is anyone among you sick? Now, there is going to be a, se there's a sequence here. And there is a, there's a contrast here. There are people suffering, and there are people who are taking heart, and there are people who are sick. Now, I'm going to leave it like that for now. I'm going to come back and wrap that up at the end. But I want you to know that there is a sequence here. Is anyone among you sick? Right. So if you're, if you're suffering, you must pray. If you're cheerful, you must sing praise. If anyone is among you is sick, he must call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. Now, the word here for sickness, let's deal with that first. It's a word that, that essentially is emphasizing that they are completely without strength. It covers everything. It is a weakness that could be produced by sickness. But this is something that is not, uh, Pastor, I have the sniffles. Could you pop round again with the olive oil? That's not it. This is the word that is used in John chapter 4 and in Philippians chapter 2 with Epaphrodites when people almost died. This is the, verse, the, the word that is used in John 11 with Lazarus and Acts chapter 9 with Dorcas when they did die. This is not just, you know, I'm a bit, I, I'm having a day off work, would you pop round with the olive oil? This is, this is people on the brink of death. And he's saying, and there is a purpose to this context, and the flow from verse 13, if you're in that situation, if you're scared that you may not see life, call the elders of the church, come and have them pray over you, and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, we don't do that. We don't typically do that. I just want you to know, we're gonna explain this passage, and when we've explained it, hopefully you'll understand it by the end of it, but once it's explained, I want you to know this. It might seem weird to you, but it's there, and it's in the Bible. 
It, why, why is it not weird that when we, take the, we open up that baptismal pool and we take people and we get people with their clothes on and we stick them under water and then we lift them up again? Do we do that every, in everyday life? No, we don't. But we do it in church. Why do we do it in church? Because it's commanded in scripture and it symbolizes something. So in this situation, once it's explained, and you understand what it is, if this situation were to arise, I will anoint your head with olive oil. I will. Because I think it's what we're supposed to do, as weird as it might seem to us. But I think that the situation is rare, as you will see momentarily, but if it were to happen, then I will be there. There's a couple of things here as well. I've got to keep this flowing, but... Notice, let him call. The onus is not on the elders to come to the person who is sick. The onus is on the person who is sick to come to the elders and say, please come and pray and anoint me. That's important. That'll, again, that will be relevant in a minute. And then look at verse 15. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. There is there seemingly... A really clear declaration that if this protocol is followed, that the person will be saved. Now, I know that the health, wealth and prosperity nutters love this kind of stuff, but they should hate it. Because every time they do it and a person isn't healed, then they'll say, oh, well, you don't have enough faith. That's their favorite get out clause, you know. I've got the gift of healing and I'm praying for you to be healed and blah, 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 blah. And you're not healed. Would you, why am I not here? Well, that's your fault. But look who it is who's praying. It's a prayer of faith. And who's praying? It's the elders. In other words, the people who are doing the praying, it's they are the ones who are doing the prayer of faith, not the person who's, who's receiving it. In other words, if you pray and it doesn't happen, it's the prayer of faith that does it. So it's not the get out clause that they think it is. Now, there's a couple of very important little distinctions here. First of all, notice that it's the elders who are called, not people with the gift of healing. Now, we could, we could debate forever the gift of healing, whether it continues, whether it doesn't continue. That's not for this sermon. What I will say is this. At this time, the gifts were in effect. Everybody agrees on that. And there were people who had the gift of healing at this time in that community. Everybody agrees on that. And yet they are not called upon. That's significant. The elders are the ones who are called. And the other thing to note is that it is the prayer literally of the faith. It's the prayer of the faith. It's, it's not to do with I have faith in this particular result, but the faith that we have. The big picture of faith. Now, with all that said, let's look at the end of this verse, which is crucial. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. It seems to me that this connection, on the one hand, can be problematic, on the other hand, it's a solution. The reality here is this. The way that I would interpret and understand this, and then there's, there's one little problem with it, we'll explain that afterwards, but the way I would understand it is this. Is that with this phrase at the end, there seems to be a context here where a person is suffering and a person is sick and dying because of their sin. Now, if you think that that's strange or weird, or that's kind of like, where on earth do you get that from? Well, we should turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and have a look there. I don't want to get distracted here by too much other than to show that it happens. I'm reading from chapter 11 and verse 29 of 1 Corinthians, talking about taking the Lord's Supper without examination. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. That's the Apostle Paul. You're taking communion, and the context of that is not merely, I forgot to confess a particular sin before I took communion. There's, there's a bigger context here. But nonetheless, all we need for now is to understand that there is a place where people profess to be Christians, come and take communion and say, I am trusting in the blood of Christ for my sins, and their lives are something completely and utterly different. And what is the result of that? That some people are weak, some people are ill, 
<clears throat> and some have even died. And what it literally says there for die is fallen asleep, which is terminology that Paul uses only of people who are Christians, only of people who are saved. So just as a complete aside, whatever you believe about the perseverance of the saints doctrine, you've got to incorporate this. There are going to be some people who are living double-minded lives who end up being judged by God and they end up actually dying. And most people in our circles might say, ah, oh, they didn't persevere to the end. Maybe they weren't saved. And yet Paul says they've fallen asleep. Should be kept, man. Uh, yeah, let me just say it. I think that's probably more likely what the situation with Ravi Zacharias heard lots of people saying, guy's never saved, look at the sin in his life before he died. And I just look at this verse and I say, not necessarily. You can have a person who's living in willful, rebellious sin and is claiming to be of Christ and is living as if they're not and there's, there's, there's hypocrisy and duplicity and all sorts and God, and God gives them some sort of sickness and then they get worse and they get weaker and they don't repent of that sin and then they die. And then maybe that sin comes out after they die. This happens. This is Bible. Right? So back to James. So what we're seeing here is we're seeing a situation where um, it says that somebody comes, they have to instigate it. It's not going to somebody who has the gift of healing, because it's not just about healing. They're going to elders, and they're going there, and if they've committed sins, then... They are forgiven those sins when they have this prayer. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, one another and pray for one another. In other words, there, is a con there seems to me to be a confession going on here. Now, just to sum that up, because I know it's a new concept to many people, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm seeing here is this, that there are those in, who are suffering. Are you suffering? Yes, we're all suffering. Let's pray. Are you one of those people who are taking heart in your suffering, standing firm, steadfast? Praise God. Or are you one of those people that the double-mindedness has gotten so bad that God is disciplining those he loves? What do you do? You call the elders, not healers. You're not just sick. It's not just that you happen to be sick. It's not just that you happen to have a disease. You call the elders. Now notice who has to do the calling. It's the individual. Let me just say this really clearly. This is not a Job's friend scenario. If someone comes to you and they say, I'm sick, then you presume that they are sick and it's got nothing to do with sin in their life. You presume that every single time. You do not go out of your way and you do not go into people's lives and say, oh man, look, they're sick and, and they, they, they said this the other day and I know they read those kind of books and they follow that person on, on you know. Stop it! The only person who gets to make this decision is the individual. They are the ones who call the elders. And that's why they call elders, because it's an issue of sin. And God's judgment upon them for their sin and for their double-mindedness. Now, you think James couldn't up the ante anymore after five chapters of this, but he's basically saying, watch out, there could be really... You know, you're concerned about your life and your comfort and your well-being. The irony is that you take that to an extreme and you could lose your comfort and well-being to the most extreme degree. And so they are the ones who make this decision. They call the elders. I know, um, I know one guy who is you know, teacher slash pastor who says, you know, once somebody was in a very serious situation, like was basically you know, very close to death, they perceived that this was due to the sin in their life. They made that decision. No one else did. They called upon this friend of mine and he came to them and he anointed them with oil and they confessed the sins that they'd done. And do you know what? They got healed. What happens if you think that that's your situation? Someone comes and they pour oil on you. The, the, I come and pour oil on you and then you don't get healed. Well, then your sickness wasn't due to your sin. Because if it was, then you're healed. And that's the explanation of the guarantee here. Because we all get sick. We're all going to get sick. We're all going to die. We're, all, we're, we're in this fallen world, right? But if the sickness is discipline, then we confess our sins and he is just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, right? Guaranteed healing. 
That's why it's guaranteed. Now, the only potential problem with that interpretation is the if here. And my understanding of that is that the punctuation should perhaps be slightly different. And if he is, in the prayer of faith, will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up, the and here can also be translated even. The Lord will raise him up even if, or even though essentially he's committed sins, period, he will be forgiven. That's how I would understand it. So there's, there's slight problems however you interpret it, but I think that this is the best way of understanding it. I'm not comfortable saying, well, it kind of seems to say that you're all guaranteed to be healed, but you might not be. I, I just can't do that with the text. I think the best way of understanding it, in the, particularly in the context of James, is, is, is this. And I think that there are some who, uh, everyone's suffering, some who are steadfast in their suffering, and there's some who are double-minded. And therefore, they are at risk of receiving physical judgment. And the solution to that is to come to the elders. When do you come to the elders? When you're sick to the point of death. That's why I think we have the next phrase, therefore, verse 16, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. This is not saying that you've got to, every time you sin, tell another person, you can go to God and what have you, but there is a corporate sense here in which obviously you're to confess your sins to the pastor if you're near death and you think it's because of sin in your life, but I think there is a sense in which if, you, uh, if you're going and confessing and praying on a regular basis, then these things don't arise, you know? You get diagnosed with something and it's, it's irritating, and you've got that little niggling thing in your heart. Man, I wonder, if, I wonder if this is discipline. I mean, I really haven't sorted out that area of my life. Maybe the spirit impresses that on your heart. And you're like, oh, maybe, maybe. Well, then pray. It gets really bad. Just go and share with someone. Man, I need help for this issue. I need help. I, I'm, I'm falling. I keep falling in this area. Help me. That's what we do. We're family. We don't beat people up when they confess. We lift them up. We help them. And so I think that if we were regularly confessing and regularly praying, then, um, then this wouldn't arise. Um, and, I, and you know what? In our, I, the saddest thing is, is that I think this probably happens more than we realize, but I think the kind of churches that it happens in, they're so compromised and so corrupt that the people leading the churches, they're pretty much in the same situation. So, I mean, you know. And in our circles, we don't really see it much because hopefully there's not the same degree of comp uh, compromise. Um, but nonetheless, it does happen. And I think, you know, confess your sins to one another, pray for one another that you may be healed. We do not want to have divine discipline in our midst. And if we do, there needs to be confession and there needs to be prayer. <clears throat> and the, the bizarre thing is that, of course, we struggle with that. We struggle with the, like, you know, so you just you put oil and you pray and a person's healed. And James then deals with that, and he says, he gives us this statement, the, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And the, over the years, I've often wondered, what is the righteous person here? I mean, surely in Christ, we're all righteous, right? We've been declared righteous. So surely it's just an encouragement. Hey, Christians, your prayers are really valuable. Having got here through the previous chapters, I can't really see it that way. I think here in the context, it seems to really be saying, look, there are those who are single-minded and there are those who are double-minded. And when you have people who are double-minded and God judges them, the those who are single-minded need to pray for them that they will become single-minded like they are. That we who are stronger help those who are weak. That's what's going to happen in the last couple of verses that we'll be in to wrap up this book next time. And so I think that we need to understand that in this context, it's likely that the prayer is the prayer of somebody who is living in a way that is appropriate for their faith. And they're walking in a manner worthy of the calling by which they've been called, as Paul would say. And when a person is living that way, there is great power in prayer when it does its work. I think the New American Standard says the prayer of a righteous person can accomplish much. Oh boy, can it accomplish. And look at this example given. And we'll do this quite quickly. We're, at, we're almost out of time. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. And then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, <coughs> and the earth bore its fruit. Now, 
Normally, when there's Old Testament references, I turn to the Old Testament, but he's just using it as an illustration here. You can go to uh, 1 Kings 17, and you can see the declaration that it will not rain. God's spoken to him. You can see in chapter 18, and, and the end of that chapter, you can see, and those of you, by the way, doing the Bible reading plan, I think that's tomorrow's reading, so you can enjoy that tomorrow. But um, you, can, you can see how Elijah prayed, <clears throat> boom, it just stops raining. And then Elijah prays again, and boom, it rains. It's miraculous. It's astonishing. <clears throat> if you're a person who's sold out for Jesus, do not underestimate what your prayers can do. And you say, oh, but that's Elijah. You know? I mean, look at Elijah. Elijah didn't die. Elijah was called up into heaven by God. You kind of put him on this pedestal. You think he's different than you. That's why James very specifically says he was a man with a nature like ours. Literally, he had passions like us. Why is that relevant? That's relevant because in the flow of the whole book of James, it's been saying, hey, why do you fight? Why do you quarrel? It's those passions within you. It's your nature. It's your desire to have what you want. It's your selfishness. It's your pride. That's your problem, folks. That's why you're double-minded, because you want your way. You're proud. You're selfish. You have all these passions within you. Elijah was exactly the same. He was exactly the same. And yet when he prayed... And we have prayers that can turn people's lives around. We have prayers that can bring healing when people are in sin. We have prayers that can bring healing when they're not in sin. We have prayers that can change government. We're commanded to pray for those who rule over us. Most of us just complain about them. Commanded to pray for them. Pray for their souls, pray for their salvation, pray for their policies. Why don't we? Because we doubt this. We doubt this. It's not us. It's God who works in us. And let me just end with this. Why anoint with oil? Going back a little bit. Because oil in the Bible is representative of the Holy Spirit. When Paul speaks of the ministry of the Holy Spirit within us in Ephesians chapter 1, he goes on to say that this is the power that raised Jesus from the dead. Within us, as Christians, we have the indwelling Holy Spirit. And however you interpret that, it means without a shadow of a doubt, John 14, that he is with us and will never leave us. And he empowers us to live the lives that he's commanded us to live. And he can accomplish whatever he chooses. And he can use whoever he chooses. And if God raises you up for a task, then he will use you. And his power through your prayers will change things incredibly. So, my friends, let's end by considering how this links to chapter 1 one last time. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. That's the parallel passage. That's what he's alluding back to. That's our context. Let him pray. You're suffering? Pray. And so, maybe you, like me, think this. I'm just such a mess. I'm never going to overcome this. I've always struggled with that. I've messed up again. Why do I never learn? Why have I fallen? Why do I struggle? And we find ourselves in that cycle. Don't you dare think that way. Because the one who is going to change you, the one who will enable you to overcome your sin, is Jesus Christ, not you. That's Romans 8 and verse 1. It's not in the context of you, there's no condemnation because, because Jesus died on the cross for your sins and so you're going to go to heaven. It's in the context of fighting the fight within us, dealing with sin, struggling. Who will save me, wretched man that I am? Jesus will save you. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We are not condemned to live a life of double-mindedness. 
We can be single-minded. We can give ourselves wholly, completely to Jesus Christ and see the world changed around us for his good and his glory through, through sinners like us. We, we can change the world because he saved us because he had work for us to do. He can do all of that. He can deal with whatever sins we have, whatever habit patterns we have, whatever, whatever is in our past, whatever is in our present, whatever is in our future. He can deal with it all. So what do we have to do? If any of you lacks wisdom, ask him. But ask him in faith, knowing what you're asking for and being sure that that's what you want. You see, my friends, the problem is not that we are not able to change. The problem is we don't want to change. I pray that we will become a church of single-minded people, praying to God for that wisdom, walking purely, living maturely, giving God the glory, knowing that we're asking for trials, knowing that we're asking for difficulty, but standing firm, standing steadfast, taking heart and praising him every step of the way. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. What a powerful, powerful book James is. You've rattled our cages week after week, Lord. It's only a little bit of rattling left. May we heed the call. May we pray. May we pray for wisdom. May we ask. May we beg. May we plead. Have your way in our lives, O oh Lord. Have your way in us. Whatever the cost, have your way. May we not be condemned to live our lives as adulterous, double-minded people loving the world as much as we love you. If we need to repent, Lord, convict us. If we need to be encouraged that we might stand firm, raise us up. And may we love one another and help one another so that wherever we are in our journey, we might walk together. We ask this for the glory of your Son. Amen. Amen.